Uh, hey everybody, I'm Steven. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how serverless might be useful for projects that you're working on or uh, within your organization. Um, so some context on me, I'm a product manager uh, at Cloudflare. Uh, most recently worked on the serverless integration actually with Cloudflare workers. Um, it's been lovely working with serverless for this. Uh, and before this, uh, I worked as a different, few different types of engineer, um, embedded stuff, full stack stuff, data stuff. Um, but right now I'm a product manager working at Cloudflare. Um, so if you want to try out this new integration, you can run these two commands and get started. Um, you can set up a Cloudflare account and deploy a worker to our now 152 data centers around the world. Um, you can look online. I actually had to update our documentation for this integration last night with another data center. Um, so what is serverless? And so the focus of this talk is kind of serverless is a way to minimize the engineering effort needed to ship a minimal vi viable product or to reduce liability in terms of like the amount of code infrastructure you need to ship something. Um, and so on this slide, this isn't really a, a linear amount of, like this isn't time going to the right. This is really different styles of infrastructure that you can use to deploy code. Um, so, and it kind of depends on your needs. Um, so on one hand, you have buying servers, you have co-locating servers, um, you have what we're here talking about tonight, serverless and functions as a service and edge computing. Um, and then behind all this tech you all know is, is containers that um, are sort of hiding other problems from us that make our lives easier as, as developers. Um, and a lot of times like your applications may be a combination of all of these. Your needs may change over time as your business grows, as your side projects um, get more customers. Uh, and I'm sure all of you work at sort of different sized companies that may solve these problems in different ways. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about like how Cloudflare may be useful um, for the problems that you're solving. And kind of looking forward to the future, so I, I guess I did lie, maybe this is time going to the right. Um, there's some very interesting ways that people are now starting to think about how we might deploy applications. So one might be like a mobile edge where your code is running in every cell tower um, as a way to get closer to your, your actual customers. Um, so this is a question to think about when you're working on your side projects or, or you're asking yourself, how do you add value um, on what you're working on? And it's like, what business are you in? Um, and so I had this question proposed to me at, at one of my previous jobs where we were working on, on uh, I was working on embedded software. And so it's like kind of the buy build question of like, we need ARM CPUs. Are we going to ask for a custom build of these? Are we going to buy what's off the shelf? Off the shelf? Are we gonna, going to design our own CPUs? This is at a payments processing company. So like you can guess what, our, what made sense for our needs. Um, and the same question you can ask yourself. Um, what value do these pieces of technology add to your customers? Do your customers care that you use containers and microservices and um, I don't know what you're caching, uh, what, what you use for caching, hopefully you're using Cloudflare or some product like that. Um, what, like the fact that your configuration management is using the last thing you saw on, on Hacker News or are you delivering high quality experiences at low latency to your customers around the world? And I can guess if a lot of you work in tech, you can probably drill down your job into this very high level description of what you do. Um, and a lot of it I see is around kind of simplifying the technology that you use and really seeing technology as a means to an end to delivering experiences for your customers. Um, and so serverless is a tool that we're talking about tonight that can help you achieve this. Um, and so I think the real value in serverless for your customers or for what you're working on is that it's really a way to express first class business logic. Um, and we'll get to some other benefits, but really focusing on what's the minimal amount of code and infrastructure that you need for, uh, to add value to your customers. Um, this is kind of the business use case. Uh, if you, you need a justification essentially for, for using technology um, in your organization, and maybe it's different for your personal projects where you're looking to explore and learn new things. Um, but when you're really trying to ship something that's gonna be useful to someone, which um, is probably your, your end goal, um, at, at some point you have to make decisions. It's like, I'm not going to write my own web server in C. I'm not going to write my own Nginx for this project. Um, and so you decide what pieces of te technology you're gonna use to make your life easier. And the argument around serverless is really, you should focus on your business and what adds value to your customers. Um, and from an engineering perspective, this makes a lot of sense. Like uh, if you've been an engineer for a while, you've probably heard like engineers say things like this, like code, every line of code is a liability. Every piece of infrastructure is a liability because it will break. Um, 
People don't like getting paged in the middle of the night. People want to review less code rather than more code. People want things to be simple rather than complicated. And, I'll, and I've been in the situation where it's fun to build complex things for side projects. But when you're working with other people in an, in an organization to deliver value to people, it really makes sense to think about the people that you're working with too and how you can like, work together very, very easily. Um, and so if you're in a situation fortunate enough where you can do this at a company, at a funded company, at a company or on a project that's generating revenue, you can pay someone to worry about these problems. Um, and the extent to which you can pay to get rid of these problems varies depending on your needs and um, what you're looking to do. Um, the interesting thing about serverless is that you can really get rid of a lot of uh, DevOps work that you would otherwise end up having to do yourself. That really frees up a lot of your time to focus on adding value to your customers, building features. And this goes further if you're like a one-person show building an application where engineering is a means to an end to deliver an application to your customer when you should be spending your time talking to customers and marketing your application. And you know, React Native and, and all these other cool technologies are just really fast ways to get you to the point of adding value. Um, and of course, I mean, everything has an asterisk. Like sometimes it does make sense for you to build things yourself. And that's why like large companies exist and, and Cloudflare to some people is an enormous reverse proxy in front of like their websites. Um, and uh, depending on your scale, it makes sense to actually build these, these uh, things out yourself. Um, that's why you know, every company doesn't use React Native or, or you know, companies actually build things for themselves. So this actually means that going along kind of with this, this asterisk of serverless might be like a one, like isn't quite a one size fit, fits all um, situation, that there's problems that you have all probably heard of around serverless where there was a very interesting post, I think yesterday, around someone benchmarking um, the cold start problem in serverless, which is something that is pretty much, it's unsolved for a majority of serverless products. Um, we'll get to why it's not a problem with Cloudflare. Um, <laughs> of course, I have to plug Cloudflare. Um, if, are you all familiar with the cold start problem? Can I see hands? So essentially, it means that as your application is receiving more requests, um, the software that's managing your container that you're not aware of um, in your serverless application has to provision more and more containers. Um, and there is an associated latency cost with creating new containers. Um, so this means that um, you might be at a situation where you have one, uh, one container in one part of the world, um, or you might have none, depending on how your application is scaled, and that some requests may take a long time, and you can get a lot of variance in latency. Um, which, depending on your application, may not be, be useful. Um, but again, that's depending on the serverless model where you're building, for example, a Node.js application or a Django application, and you're putting it into someone else's container, and, and another company is managing it for you. Um, there's some other problems with the traditional serverless model that I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, if you deploy uh, something to AWS Lambda, it can take up to 30 minutes to propagate across the world. That's certainly inconvenient. Um, and uh, latency, uh, you're typically deploying to a specific region unless you're, specific, uh, unless you're intentionally deploying your application to multiple regions. And um, this raises a lot of questions around what is your data model then? What is your, your consistency model across the world? Um, cost, um, we'll get to that in a sec actually. And then how this fits in with your existing code base, your existing product. Um, if you have an existing code base, it can make sense to break out certain parts of it into something that might fit in serverless, something where either you can tolerate variance in latency or something where you don't know, you're, you're, you have large variances in the number of, of instances that you need. Um, so you have endpoints that are scaling a lot based on a lot of traffic. You might have IoT devices that are checking in more during the day than they are at night based on things that they detect on webcams, for example. Um, going into cost, you've all probably heard this as well, that serverless is expensive. Um, at least for a lot of traditional providers, for Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft, typically using a serverless model is expensive because um, all of those providers know that you're basically trading convenience for cost. Um, and for a lot of us, it makes sense. If you're working on your own project, if you're working at a company, um, it makes sense to focus on how do you add more value to your customers versus spending time maintaining servers and making sure that um, your packages are up to date on your servers and that you're using the latest version of Chef and, and all these questions that uh, maybe don't need to be worried about anymore. Um, does anyone have an idea of what this number means? 263. So going into how expensive serverless can be, there are 263 line items that you can be billed for on AWS Lambda. 
<laughs> so it, serverless can be very expensive. It can be very complicated as well to understand. I'm sure you've all gotten an AWS bill. Don't, I, I actually have a bill that I've, I get emails about every month for the last three or four years that I owe Amazon 42 cents. I don't know what for, um, but you can imagine that's, <laughs> it's a much, much more significant if you're running real code on, uh, on, a, on Lambda, on uh, a serverless provider. And it's interesting that from, from a pricing perspective, a lot of these providers pass their costs on to you in a way that their problems kind of become yours. That you may see that, um, for example, on Google, um, bandwidth out of certain regions is more expensive than others. And it's not really, it, you can tell it's something that they've not optimized for and they have as costs that they pass on to you as a customer that you have to worry about in like, well, what if I get a lot of customers in Australia? What if it becomes really big in Australia? And the modeling I did around pricing my product doesn't fit into my costs. Um, our workers' customers don't complain about it being expensive. Um, we have a model where we already have servers all over the world. We have at least 152, soon to be, I guess, 154. Um, and we have the exact same code running in every one of these servers around the world. This means that if you're, if you're writing a worker that uses other Cloudflare services, there's no latency, no latency, when you're using other Cloudflare services, for example, because everything runs on the exact same machine. Um, it's not even like an Amazon problem where you're, go or you're doing intra-data center network or intra-data center networking. Um, we're, we've designed like our network in a way that we can pass on the same benefits that we get from operating this global network to our customers. So when you write a worker script, it goes to every single machine around the world and that your code is as physically close to your customers as possible without actually running um, on their device. And something that we try to keep in mind um, that a lot of people, a lot of people on companies don't have the resources of a company like Amazon, who famously found that 100 milliseconds of latency cost them 1% of sales. And this is really dramatic. I mean, economies of scale are definitely a thing for Amazon that can mean a lot of money. Um, but for a regular person, like focusing on 1% of latency might not be the way that you add the most value to your customers. And so we want to make sure that we can del deliver those experiences to our customers. And so it's something we focus a lot on with Cloud for Workers. Thank you for letting me speak here. <laughs>